In the old days, the public, me, um, the rest of us, uh, to most hardcore carnival people, um, we were suckers, chumps, marks, um, and rubes. The origin of the term rube is a little cloudy, but the use of the expression, hey rube, had a very specific meaning. And in the old days of the carnival, whenever any trouble would break out, the carnies would go around yelling, hey rube, hey rube. And what that meant was there was a fight going on and all the carnies would pour out of whatever their joints were, out of their shows and they'd make sure that the fight ended up mm, not to their detriment. Those days were also pretty brutal and pretty rough for the carnival people. They were from out of town. They, they were the people from away. Uh, and unless you've ever been on a carnival midway and watched the way the public treats the show folk, you've never quite seen how low people can go whom you thought were civilized. Problem with carnival is that it gives people a feeling of license. In the old days, at least, of course, we're more respectful nowadays for all of the savvy that, that most carnival people like to think they have. It's a lot easier for them to end up on the wrong end of things uh, as opposed to coming out on top. Coming out on top in the old carnival days basically meant you got to leave town. You were the thing to mistrust. You were the thing from away. Uh, you were the thing that was bad because you were coming to town. We're going to have fun riding them rides. We're going to go to those shows. but. When did you say you were leaving? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Ray I'd like to welcome you both to our freak show! It's gonna take us right in its finger. Full of rock and roll! My name is the Great Orbex, and you are currently in my home. My name is Sweet Pepper Klopek. I am the one half of the world's most extreme two-man circus sideshow comedy magic extravaganza known as the Monsters of Schlock. I'm one half of the Monsters of Schlock. That is who I am and what I do. Amongst other things, I uh, at times teach physics at the University of Guelph. I'm a uh, professional taxidermist and freak animal maker. I'm an avid cat lover. Uh, I'm Allison, the legendary Klopex, greatest punk band of all time. Well, they are the uh, single greatest punk band of all time. Going on 17 years this May. Best band you'll ever see. Dynamite. Best. I also do magic, work part time in a record store, restore antique and hot rod vehicles and motorcycles. Yes, I also part owner of a tattoo shop. Mm -hmm. I don't do tattoos though, I have no artistic talent whatsoever. Hey, uh, my name is the Lizard Man. In case you missed it, this is my 13th year at Amjam. Now, the Lizard Man was one of the first people that I'd ever spoken to about uh, sideshow acts when I was learning. He's a, a very funny uh, friend of ours. Who uh, he is a lizard. The the word mentor is probably incredibly too corny or uh, uh, important to use to describe that relationship. And he was one of the people who, uh, when I was getting into the business, was very open to the idea of, of discussing things and actually being spoken to. But doing stuff, we became friends very fast, very easy, and you know, we just know each other since then. I've done uh, done a bunch of different shows with him here and there. I actually did like a two or three week tour with him a couple years ago. I need you fuckers to count. We're gonna kill a Canadian for you. On three, one, two. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lizard Man and I are completely on 
He's gone from being a, a, a large influence to, to somebody who's actually a, a good friend. And he's a stupid green douche. We just had breakfast and get ready. Head over to Ripley's. Yeah, we're at Ripley's Times Square today, which actually is pretty exciting. It so it seems uh, surreal whenever you come to big, big cities like this. Cause you see them on the TV, and then you come in and actually perform in them, and it seems uh, like something that you would have seen on, on the television. Oh, who brings a bow and arrow in a box? Yeah, are you still you're you're still fucked or what? That'd be fucking crazy. Oh, don't eat that. <laughs> Where is there an eat more in there? Is that from Butch? Yeah. Oh. Eat more is a good bar though, eh? Do it. <laughs> can, can you do side whips? Yeah, apparently too. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Get sick about them. Shut up. Fix it in post. I travel. Metro car. Train's coming. Hurry. Oh. I believe we're doing a uh, performance in the front of Ripley's, believe it or not, which is very exciting because we love Ripley's. It's always fun to go and see new stuff. And I think they have a bust of Lizard Man there as well. It's always been my, one of my, legitimately one of my childhood dreams has always been Ripley's Believe It or Not. Step right up and see a show. Come right up, ladies and gentlemen, right out here in front of Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum today. Ladies and gentlemen, step right up. What you're going to see up here is a bona fide, certified, guaranteed, one of a kind freak show, ladies and gentlemen. What we're going to start out here with today is a stunt called The Human Blockhead. This stunt goes back to the sideshow days of yore, ladies and gentlemen. This nail measures five and three quarter inches in length, which is average. Thank you. Perhaps you, ma'am, right there. Just big give it up. Come right on up and just check and make sure and verify that this is indeed a real nail. Give her a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, so that she has the courage to come over here. All right. Please just push on the end of it. Make sure it doesn't collapse. Make sure it's not rubber. Great. And now, ma'am. Not that I don't trust her hands a bit, but... I see the guy that you're with, so... You're going to grab onto the end of this nail, and you're going to pull it out of my face, okay? But please, don't freak out or spaz on me, all right? Here we go. Reach over. Be very gentle. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen, the extraction. Now, Monique. As you can tell by the lack of response, the people directly behind you, the people behind me, were unable to see any of that. So I'm going to need you to rotate over to the side like this so we can do it in front of you. You're going to wait! Because <laughs> you're holding a giant nail in my face. All right. Turn this way. Turn this way. Remember, kids, try this at home. Go ahead. You come in this way. Perfect. And we'll get these guys. Just come right up here. Come right up so you get a chance to see. Step right in. Pack right in, ladies and gentlemen. Believe it or not. Real. It's actually going to happen. You're going to see an idiot with a nail in his nose. The lovely Monique's about to pull it out. Here we go. The extraction. And wait a second. There we go. Give it a little how she going. Mediocre applause is appropriate at this point. Go ahead. <laughs> Here we go. The entire removal. of Schlock are about to go into the black hole. Believe it. Or not. <laughs> oh, we went, uh, hung out with Magic Brian and Albert Cadabra.
We're gonna sweet a throwing card injury. Got a crazy card fight. Oh yeah, lots of it. We had a beard. Stuck on our way to go see. Who's the guy who uh, split my tongue and did my ears? And he's gonna do some other awful stuff to me today, presumably. We make it there in time. <laughs> We're not sure what yet. A couple options. Do my ears again, or uh, pull my beads on my chest, maybe. Or do some other awful stuff to my ears. Internal stitching, eh? I'm gonna try. I mean, I, I, I'm good with internal stitching. I'm gonna try to do it with an ear. <laughs> Is there something about me that, uh, like, everybody who works on me just went, well, I've never tried this, so what do I do with an ear? Ear. Expendable. Yeah. yeah. See what happens, eh? Do you ever eat this? Gross. Hey, so it's February, it's winter time. We're closed in Coney Island, but welcome to Sideshows by the Seashore. We run the last traditional 10 in one circus sideshow anywhere in the world. Freaks, wonders, and human curiosities, they are here. They are real, they're alive, but not today, I'm sorry. And Coney Island is, is, is simultaneously so much more myth than reality and so much more real because of it. You figure it, it, it went through any number of heydays from when it first became a, a vacation slash summer retreat uh, in the 1800s, up, through, up and down through numerous uh, heydays, declines, another heyday, another decline, build an amusement park, it burns to the ground, bulldoze this, move that around. It's a place that's been in constant flux since it was Coney Island. I'm James Taylor and I'm the publisher of Shocked and Amazed, the world's only journal devoted to novelty and variety exhibition, uh, specifically sideshow, burlesque, Wax museums, motor drones, monkey speedways, you name it. He's not the douchey singer-songwriter. He's the James Taylor. This man is the uh, sideshow guys of sideshow. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you, the internet wasn't what it is now. And, and the only guy who had information about this stuff was James. All the old timers were dying off. James was one of the only guys to go down and interview the people who were still alive who'd been in traveling shows. I think a lot of people have a delusion about, or sort of delusional about what the old sideshows were uh, compared to what they are now. A lot of people get up on that soapbox to talk about how great the old days were as opposed to today, or, oh, it's more this, that, and the other nowadays than it ever could have been. But in fact, sideshow as it was, was an entertainment form of its time. It was about getting you in, taking your money, giving you enough of a show to get you out the other end so that you wouldn't be ticked off and thinking that, gee, I paid all this money for nothing. You'd do 20 shows a day, 25 shows a day. An old show guy told me not that long ago, he says, you know, he says, I tell people all the time that there's not one act today can hold a candle to what those old sh shows were, but there's not one of those old show guys that could survive the way the business is now. I mean, they expect to see you up there working it. Uh, I am Martin Ling, the Suicide King. I'm a sword swallower and general sideshow performer. I'm Danny Borneo, uh, do blockhead, sword swallowing, whip cracking, sexiness. I'm Reggie Boucher. <laughs> I do a uh, fire, a uh, mild geek in. I'm Candy Mayhem, and I uh, I MC the show, and I'm a burlesque performer. There's a lot of people that are like super purists, and they're like, oh, well, that's not sideshow, and that's not that, and we totally realize like we're not under a tent, but things evolve. I'm Stefan Walker, um, the founder of Cheeky Monkey Sideshow. I perform as Swami Omami. I'm Sally the Cinch. Bye. Dance and I cinch my waist to uh, 12 inches. I don't think it's going to die out at any point. I think it'll just continue to, to evolve. And um, I don't know, I think it'll be cool to see where it goes. The next step really for Sideshow is to cross into be even sort of more mainstream entertainment. It's been sort of embraced mainstream-wise as 
a weird thing that's okay. And you've hit this point where it's just kind of like, watch me strangle myself with my like chain wallet. It's gonna be amazing. And then people are like, <laughs> that's Sideshow. And eventually it's gonna come down and like level out. And I think that at that point, Sideshow is gonna be in a much better place. They always have to have the weirdo on America's Got Talent or you know, something like that. That one weird act, they have to have it for the hook. But it's not accepted enough that it'll ever win. People that have wound up staying in that field because they actually truly love it. And those are going to be the really skilled professional people that have been doing it throughout the insurgents. And I think you see the same thing with a lot of the variety arts. The fact that there are tented shows and the fact that there are still shows doing it the, the way that they were done, I have great respect for it. Well, I want to see where it just goes on its own naturally. Because, um, you know, like, like we said, things have already changed from what they used to be. It's, it's barely even circus anymore. So right. I guess, you know, that evolution is sort but of like, that's you thing. know, is it a good thing or a bad thing that you're going so far away from? Is it barely even from circus from or is that what circus is now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is, that's, that's like saying we're barely question. even side -shot. Right, no, yeah, yeah that, that's essentially the question is, you know, is the evolution good? Some of the things that we do in our act, I don't know. I mean, we our show has varied over the years. Uh, it's, it's gone through all types of different permutations. It's gotten to the point where Pepper doesn't even really speak on stage anymore. I personally get hurt. My brother speaks. Then we go home. Uh, very much you have the, the, the classic two-man comedy combination of straight man and, and, and comedic relief uh, that takes place. I, I, I liken it very much to uh, an Abbott and Costello or the Smothers Brothers. He enjoys hurting me very much. He's uh, hit me in the face with a chainsaw. He's, uh, well, I thought he broke my arm. He's giving me severe permanent Did tendon damage in my arm, which is very fun. nice. I love him. How did he do that? He threw a ladder at me. The appeal comes from, a, especially with what we're doing, you have this very... Um, sort of overinflated chance of, or the degree of danger in this concept that there is a lot of, of pain being inflicted on various individuals. I do a lot of stuff with animal traps and um, straitjacket escapes and no chainsaws anymore, but I will get back on that horse. I can't let it beat me because mm -hmm. we had a chainsaw in the act for two years before this and eventually I will uh, wield that saw again. The, the, the audience comes to identify with Pepper as being the butt of of so much of the the impact, very much like a a, a Bud Abbott or a Curly, uh, you know, where I'm Mo. What? The ultimate goal is to set a bear trap off of my face and not die. I don't know if that's possible. I just want to slam my face, full face, into a bear trap. And that allows the audience to identify with him as a as a as a character who's accessible, and as a character who represents a lot of um, perhaps what they feel on an everyday basis, that they're constantly being berated or they're constantly being put down and that they're going through some sort of psychological pain that mimics his physical pain. So then it makes it even more impactful at the end when the whole thing is turned around and I literally get my balls busted after busting his balls for the entire show. He's opening up for my band, the Legendary Club, next greatest band of all time. It was actually the first show we ever did together. He was doing the, the classic laying on the bed of nails, cinder block on the chest, sledgehammer break, boom. He decided to kick it up a notch, so they lit it on fire. Um, and while my assistant was putting the fluid on the brick that was on me, uh, somebody from the audience lit the fluid on fire, and it fell out and hit me in the face. Once people realized, and he rolled off the stage and was screaming, the worst shriek you could ever imagine. And finally, they stuffed him up with a shirt. And then uh, got up on stage and said, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, the great Orbachs. The last thing he said to me was make, just make it seem like it was part of the show. Uh, Pepper came, too. He followed, um, which was, you know, an incredible act of kindness. I was in the burn ward for 10 days. So the matterers got up right after, you know, everybody witnessed Orbachs almost die. And they said, ladies and gentlemen, the great Orbachs. And Hooch gave a big clap, and there's people crying and wanting to vomit from the smell of death, and they tore it up. He went back, did his show, and then uh, in the next 10 days or so that I was there, he came to visit me many times. Uh, but yeah, during that time, um, uh, I had third degree burns to heal up. I healed really well. It was a fuck of a night, I tell you. The first time I saw Sweet Pepper and uh, Orbox would have been the Buskers Festival in Halifax, I suppose. Honestly, I always try to approach every time I see new people with, okay, get ready, it's gonna be what it's gonna be. They frankly blew me away. 
you got to be able to command a crowd in a way that's a lot more difficult than most people think. But what really blew me away was when I was talking with them afterwards, and they were like, well, you know, we don't normally do this outside stuff. We usually do clubs. And I was sitting there thinking, so you got guys whose principal entertainment form is in a club where people have paid their money, knowing more or less what to expect, and they've taken that show and translated it to outside, where anytime somebody gets any distraction at all, they're gone. And it looked to me like everybody in Halifax was standing around watching them do that show. And I didn't make any of that shit up either. <laughs> Surprise, guys. Going for breakfast here. It's crazy. In your face. In your face. Jesus' face himself. Oh. oh. You're making me a waffle? Of course, you fucking idiot. Now you're a pal, eh? Alright. So, Orbax, how is your morning going? Alright, a really dizzy feeling and uh, could fall asleep. Is it because you're stupid? Coffee's been shit so far this entire trip. I know. There's been two saviors, McDonald's coffee and Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Yep, that's it. We like our stimulants. We need to be appeased generally every 45 minutes or so on some level, so. That's been how long since we've seen Porter? Three years? Three years, I believe. Three glorious years. Porter, three <laughs> years. <laughs> Porter, three years. I'm sick of the vlog, so I'm going to thank you guys. Just yeah, I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Oh, extra large because I'm fat. I get no, because we had small yeah, XLs. Like <laughs> yeah, that's all. I'm not small. I barely fit my large now. Yeah. That's because you're portly. It's okay. You're Son of a bitch! I used to be such a square. Mm. And the first time I ever smoked pot was tweed. And I drink absinthe, which I had never done before. And I'm just laying there, and it was like my head was not screwed on straight. And I saw him in a Catholic schoolgirl dress. And there was a gorilla and Jesus. <laughs> we were beating the shit out of each other. And there was a there was a chicken, but the chicken wasn't you guys. It was another guy running around in a chicken. So just <laughs> packed from he came from New Hampshire, packed a chicken outfit. And I'm thinking, I'm hallucinating, because I, I smoked the devil's lettuce and nope. you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> messed I'm messed up in my head. And then later I'm like, dude, you know, I saw the clopex and they were awesome, but the fucking chicken, I must have imagined. No. <laughs> it was just it was BME was a weird time and place that by default can't exist anymore. Yeah. The history of body modification in the West, there, there were no outside influences back in the 30s or 40s. People did it because they felt the need to do it. They had an inescapable need to cut their dink in, in half or cut their dink off. They had an inescapable need to pierce themselves. And then once it hit mass culture in the late 80s, it became kind of suspect. So now you have everyone. You have people from religious backgrounds, cultural, like, like meeting people from Africa who has fa have facial scarifications versus people like myself who have facial scarifications. Obviously, there's no overlapping thing. I just did it because I wanted a scar on my face. Like that time you got set on fire. Um, body modification for me, I take a very broad view of it. I think that anything you do to your body is almost essentially body modification. Shaving or cutting your hair in a certain style, that's body modification. It's temporary body modification that's easily reversed as opposed to something like tattooing or uh, piercing, scarification. But I see them on a spectrum. It doesn't shock your parents if you have an implant in the center of your chest. It shocks your parents if you have one on your forehead. And I, I, I fought so hard against that stereotype that we were just doing stuff to shock people. And then people time and time again proved me wrong. Yeah. You know, it took me into my 30s to get my hands tattooed. You know, when I, when I applied for a mortgage, I had hand tattoos. These things affect you every day of your life. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm not saying that there's this magical Cinderella age where all of a sudden it becomes acceptable to do it. When what you have is everybody gravitating toward the metaphor of the old sideshows, all that body modification, tattooed head to foot. You know, when, when the sideshow becomes the world, it's expected that sideshow as performance change. All peoples and all cultures that we know of have, have practiced body modification to some extent. And BME was the first place on the internet that archived everything. It didn't matter if it was a good tattoo, yeah. or a healthy piercing, or a good idea or a bad idea, Shannon would put it on there. I, I, I think it's no wonder that what we see now is uh, separate from the death of the sideshows on the Carnival Midways and on the circuses, 
that you see it completely reinvented um, to meet that kind of culture halfway. You have a culture of people who don't think they're gonna make it to 80. It's irrelevant what they're gonna look like when they're 80. I'm hoping I make it to 80, but do I really need to care what I look like when I'm 80? We're gonna be fucking dead, it's not gonna matter. Most of us are atheists or anti-theists, so we might as well do it now. And I think that that used to be the corral that kept everything from exploding like it has now. Right. What if? What if doesn't exist anymore? I'm the great Orbax. My brother Sweet Pepper Klopek is trapped in the bathroom, guys. So he's stuck. As you can see, the door is uh, trapped. But we've got a team of engineers coming up who clearly will have a, at least their GEDs, so we'll be set. Is that Pepper's just standing in front of him? It's over here, man. Or somebody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's trapped inside. That's the, uh, that's the horror of the whole thing. Stand back, Pepper. Don't come close to the door. I'm trying to knock it up. So close. Yay! Threw and save sweet pepper on my birthday. The drama. The biggest present of them all. I first met Pepper seven years ago now, eight years ago. Uh, we were both performing at a uh, body modification uh, thing in Tweed, Ontario. And we met for the first time in 25, 26 years there. And that night, he uh, kicked me in the stomach and powerbombed me through a table that was on fire and covered with thumbtacks and mousetraps. Very emotional meeting for the two of us. And we had ended up that night, we were standing in a field and we were setting off like $2,000 worth of crazy industrial fireworks. Orbax wasn't drinking that night, but I was. Has about 30 strows in. And we've got our arms around each other and each one's holding a giant Roman candle in our hands and it's just firing out. And when it shot, it was very hot and I got scared and dropped it. So it hit the ground and fired. And every time it fired, it was jumping. Fireworks are shooting between us and hitting the propane tanks on this chip truck. Nobody <laughs> died though, nobody. We had talked about it prior to, to going up that there was this potential sort of connection of being separated brothers or what have you. A source on the internet said that our biological father might be a gentleman named Butch Holler, I think, or Haler, I'm not sure how they pronounce it. But apparently he's a musician and we're hoping that, I guess, Ancestry.ca maybe. Can I say that? Uh, after we met each other, it was pretty obvious the, the difference between nature versus nurture, that <laughs> some people are just naturally fucked up and that when you are on the road, you're a family and you, you, you work together, you eat together, you brainstorm ideas together, you travel in a van together. And with Pepper, it was interesting because he's one of the only people that I've ever met that we can literally spend 24 hours a day together and not want to kill each other. If it starts to the point where either one of us is getting bitchy or douchey, we're like, hey, being a dick. And it's like, sorry. And that ends it right there. That's nice though. We share beds and we cuddle and brotherly stuff, you know? No, we, well, we've got a good relationship. Uh, definitely not homosexual. Oh, James, go, James, go. At least this won't look crazy gay for the documentary. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. You guys are just retarded. Sanna faccia, book. Uncle Vito. Oh, no. Faccia, no. And you see what I'm, I'm dealing with? The fact that they still have their pants on surprises me. <laughs> I'm a teacher. And with the stuff that we're doing now and getting to do trips like this and getting to meet other people, there's a sense of community that you get out of actually hanging out and talking to them. My advice would be, yeah, don't do it, it's a hard job. <laughs> Is that the same thing you say? Everybody, everybody's been saying it. It's a don't do it. It's how you're going to make it entertaining and why are you doing it? Like, that's the thing. Yeah, like, there has a, to be a progression, a story. Uh, it's a vehicle to be your performer. Find your own angle on it and do something that's interesting. Focus on performance, not the stunts. There's too many people out there who think that the entertainment is, look, I took a, I took a skewer and stuck it through my face. More people can do it badly than can do it well, but if uh, you can do it interestingly and entertainingly, which is not a word, um, it's going to be a lot more memorable than just the stunt on its own. This is the life, the life we chose. So you know what? If, when I'm not performing, I'm not happy. When I'm not perf in front of people doing stuff, it's not fulfilling in any way. And why bother wasting time doing something you don't want to do? Like Life's too short. When you get out there to do that act, are you gonna let them know you're seeing it the way you're never gonna see it anywhere else? And that's what makes a great performer. That's what makes great talent. Oh, hey. Hello, how's it going there? When'd you guys get here? <laughs> Getting a tattoo today. 
I have to thank uh, Reggie from the uh, Old City Sideshow there for giving me my tattoo idea today. It's gonna be a tiger. She's fierce like a tiger. No, I'm getting Sideshow Bullies. Because we're uh, Sideshow Bullies. What's your favorite movie, Rich? Um, I don't know. I don't watch movies too much anymore. What's yours? Oh, that's tough. I probably got three that are tied for first. Blues Brothers, okay. Return of Living Dead, and The Burbs. Cool. Followed closely by the original Star Wars trilogy. Uh, the gist of it is, uh, it's a surface piercing on your lower back, uh, above your buttocks crack, if you will. And it's a vertical surface piercing. Uh, we couldn't, there was no name for it at all. I don't even remember how we came up with the idea of calling it a sweet pepper. But you said you wanted a piercing named after yourself, I think, and I was like, that's the one. because oh, we started with our, our piercing names. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Rook Tragus or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Dath Ampelang, was that yeah. one? <laughs> the name's Ampelang. Dath Ampelang. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to have to get somebody on the crew here to get a sweet pepper piercing. This is the beating of my life!